All right, so we're here at Expo now. We're in uh, Linkwitz room, and we've got Dr. Frank Brenner here to tell us a little bit about the speaker that they are showing this year, and it is, at a minimum, highly innovative. So, Frank, can you tell us what we're looking at, and then yeah. we'll talk about it. Yeah, it's the Linkwitz LX521.4 MG and uh, the speaker was invented like 10 years ago by Siegfried Linkwitz, the famous Siegfried Linkwitz that you might know from the linkwitz riley crossover, from the Linkwitz transformation and from that huge web website linkwitzlab.com where you find tons of information on speaker building, on psychoacoustics and all the mathematics if you want to do that. This speaker is uh, more or less uh, in, uh, in uh, three parts. This is the base bin, the subwoofer. It's an open baffle system. We hide it under the cloth here um, for aesthetic reasons. There are two 10-inch long-stroke drivers by SEAS in that that have been especially constructed for the open baffle operation. So and when they you are, say open, open baffle, does that mean it radiates to the rear as well? Exactly. You as have well? Both, both of these cloths is open, uh, totally open. So the, uh, it's a full dipole in the base as well, which, gi which uh, gives you um, a real advantage in the base and in the room interaction because um, the radiation pattern of a dipole emits 4.8 dB less energy into the room when you are receiving the same sound pressure level at your listening position. So you have less room loading, less room notes, and you can crank up 4.8 dB more to get the same room response. Okay. So that's a real advantage on the driver and you will hear it afterwards. If you fire it up, it's super dry. There is no resonant structures with it. There's no cabinet with it. So when you start a signal, it moves the cone and it doesn't have to load the resonant structure with energy and once the signal stops. So what's the miracle of how it makes low frequencies? Because usually we're loading yep. exactly. the base driver so that we can extend exactly. the low frequencies. Exactly. Yeah, and the thing is all the sound pressure level you perceive by those is done by the membranes. So we have uh, the sound pressure level is a product of the membrane area and the volume uh, and the displacement. So the volume displacement makes the sound pressure level. And we are doing that with that two 10 inch drivers that have a maximum excursion capability of plus minus one inch. And that's the volume we are transporting and we are not relying on that resonant structures like on a guitar body that reinforces the sound and that gives us the big advantage that we have the really control of the membrane and of the sound being emitted. And when you have that uh, advantage, you have a disadvantage, you need more power for that of course. And you have to equalize it towards the bottom end because a normal dipole rolls off with 6, 6 dB per octave and a driver with 12 dB per octave that makes 18 dB per octave that you ha have to compensate in your crossover or okay. in your equalizer. So is uh, EQ system part of the system. speaker concept? Exactly. exactly. That's uh, why we have in that uh, little box, we call the power box, we have five channels amplification per side which are after the active crossover. And we do all this functionality that I just mentioned for the subwoofer. We do all that inside here. And thereafter, after that equalization, we have 250 watts per driver directly to the voice coil without any interference of a resistor or a inductor or a capacitor in a, in a kind of a network. So a key thing is going to be when we get to the price, which is, what's the price? 20 for exactly this system with the Panzerholz top, we have 26,900, including the amplifiers, including the crossover, including the cables, including the shipping to your door in the US, 
and the import taxes whatsoever. Okay, got it. But I'm basically buying a speaker system with power amplification. With power, it's kind of an active speaker system mm -hmm. with the active electronics outside because we have no cabinet to build in. It's all open. Mm -hmm. So okay. we have it outside with the additional advantage that you are not uh, introducing vibration and therefore distortion into the electronics. Okay. So you have uh, dipole base, dipole which has, base. let me just broadly say, dipole advantages, and you uh, have a very strange looking mid-range and high-frequency array, yeah. so I'm guessing that's not an accident. No, it's a pure form follows function thing. Um, first of all, uh, we're starting with the next lower thing, it's the bridge, and its function is to just to decouple from that heavily shaking base. Okay. It's standing on its own on the floor, and it decouples from that base. If you, if you would mount that top bevel directly to the base, it would shake and you would get Doppler distortion easily onto, into the other drivers. On this, uh, on this bridge, we have the top baffle sitting. The top baffle contains uh, the, the CS uh, low mid-range driver. We have the high mid-range driver and the tweeter. Both are open to the back. There's no cabinet here. And as a dome driver cannot be open in the back, we have a second dome driver and their membranes are moving in sync, simulating a dipole, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Why does it have that shape? First of all, it's kind of a minimal baffle. A minimal baffle for acoustic reasons. You now have this situation that every dipole creating its figure of eight, and you have always a trade-off between the efficiency and the pattern that a dipole is emitting in, in uh, from how high can you use it as a dipole before it starts behaving badly, so to speak. Um, the higher or the, the, the wider and bigger the baffle, the lower the problem starts. And so uh, you try to make the baffle minimal. On the other hand, you have to have a perfect blending between those critical drivers when they are at their 1000 hertz uh, crossover frequency the, they should blend their radiation patterns sim um, seamlessly from bottom to top that's why we have a only a second order crossover on the on these here and so they have a, a really good pattern transition let's say from the uh, lower mid-range to the to the higher mid-range and this is all the the joint work of those drivers together with the bevel shape and uh, it's still very difficult to simulate this with computers uh -huh. and therefore this shape has been found it's Alex 521 it's the 21st shape after okay. several trials uh, that have been found to work by Siegfried Linkwitz. Just a brief interruption, esteemed viewers. As you may know, I'm Tom Martin, Chief Content Officer of the Absolute Sound. We have a new product. It's on the Substack platform, and we're going to do some interesting things with Substack, first of which is reader questions and answers. Each Monday, Readers will submit questions, we'll pick the most interesting ones, and we'll answer the questions on Friday. We'll also have early access to articles and special blogs that don't appear anywhere else. We hope you'll join us. It's only a cost of a cup of coffee per month. Just check on the screen or in the show notes below. Thanks, and now back to the show. Um, you talked about the crossover between the uh, lower mid-range and the upper mid-range exactly. driver. Where is the crossover between the low frequency and the lower mid-range driver? Yeah, it's a, it's a fourth order link with Riley crossover at 120 hertz. And uh, it's, a, it's a crossover that is designed in a way that it is at a, at a range that you have this driver not being overloaded at, 
at the lower frequencies because also those drivers have to have their 6 dB per octave dipole compensation. And uh, you have to push them harder as lower you go in frequency. And that's their mechanical limit at some point. And that determines the frequencies you can reach. So you can see every driver that you select here, um, you cannot just grab it from somewhere, from a, from a closed box speaker driver. You have to really set up a, a, a filter which driver works for what how many output can you achieve, when does it start beaming, and so on. And all these factors come into play when you have this full range dipole radiating from bottom to top as a dipole and, and having seamless transitions between those speakers. That's the real challenge of it and that's also the explains the, the, the shape, the interesting shape of that uh, of the top baffle that some reminds of a vase, some reminds of a human body with a war with a mouth and a, and 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 the chest, and uh, yeah, um, it's kind of uh, interesting looking, but it's a pure form follows function principle here. What about placement in the room? Is yeah. that critical? Easy? Hard? Yeah. Do you have specific instructions? Yeah. Yeah, the the placement in the room um, is a is a thing. First of all, you don't need room treatment. You just need the usual stuff of living in your room. You don't need base traps. You don't need um, how is it called? These reflectors, these absorbers in the walls, and so on. We don't use anything here of that, and you you shouldn't do that because it's always a filter and it works against the principles of a dipole. A dipole always wants to have the reflections coming in the same sound color as the direct sound. And if you have filters on the wall, you filter out the high frequencies there, just throwing back the low ones. So the placement, we suggest to have them at least 80 to 100 centimeters, three feet from the side, and at least three feet from the back wall. If you have more, it's even better. Mine at home are standing between the living room and the dining room. If I'm listening from the living room, the band is playing in the dining room, and when I'm sitting at the dining table, the band is playing in the living room. <laughs> it's like That's a bi-directional <laughs> fireplace. Yeah, like, like that, and you're saving one pair of speakers uh -huh. that way. And uh, once you have them placed, uh, there's a nice method how you can put the null the null of the radiation pattern is a figure of eight in the dipole and the null is the thing where very few sound pressure energy is radiated. You want to have very few energy radiated uh, in the first reflection of the wall towards the listener. Yeah, so normally you would try to absorb or exactly. maybe diffuse, I don't know, yeah. the first reflection point, yes. but because you put the null Exactly. At the, aim it at the first reflection point, yeah. then I don't need to absorb it. You exactly. killed it in the speaker, if you will. Yeah, you're right. And we put a, a mirror there and you sit at the listening chair and look at the mirror. And if you see exactly the side, the null, uh -huh. then you're perfect. You're fine. That's why you told it. We have, it, we have a pivot here. We can oh, turn okay. it. So it does rotate. So it does rotate. And so you can rotate it in that direction that gives you the null on the side reflection. For instance, my speakers are not set up in an optimal room. I have it close to a glass wall on one side and like four meters from the next wall for the other speaker. So their toe-in is obviously different because they have different uh, distances to their side walls and so they need different toe-ins. When you set this up, because you already have an amplifier, are there other requirements for the signal chain that yeah. you care about? Yeah. Um, we need a analog signal coming from a source that has volume control already done. Uh, but yeah. I could drive this with a normal preamp? You or can drive, you? Yeah, we have the Jeff Rowland preamp here. Um, you can drive that with a normal preamp, especially for source switching and for mm -hmm. volume control.
that's what you do. You can, we have uh, the, the, the uh, MyTech streamer here, we have a Lin streamer here, we have a uh, CD player and we have the vinyl here. So basically, before I get here, yeah. it's my normal equipment. That's your normal equipment and uh, we don't take care about it. The, the speakers are just happy with a very good analog signal. Where you get it from doesn't matter. Understood. And so those power boxes are fed. Each one are fed with a XLR symmetrical cable. And they do the rest. Everything we care about, everything upstream from, from the analog signal. So it first goes on in the four-way four -way active crossover and equalizer. One way is the woof, subwoofer, then this is the uh, lower mid-range way, the higher mid-range and the tweeters. The tweeters are coupled in series, so as we said, the membranes move in sync. Are there any adjustments <coughs> on the, um, the power box? Uh, power box, yeah. Yeah, there are, you can do two adjustments in these. We have on the, do you see in the left a little switch? It's a, um, a rumble filter if your vinyl produces some rumble. Mm -hmm. You can do it in two steps for heavy rumble and for medium rumble. But normally Charles brought such a good record player, <laughs> we, di we didn't need it so far. Uh, and the, the second thing is we have a, a jumper for the plus 12 dB uh, gain adjustment. You have some weak sources with, uh, with uh, maybe RCA 0 0.7 volts output and on the other hand you have those modern DACs with 6 volts output at, the, at their maximum and so you can, ha can have this kind of flexibility by adjusting um, the input gain either 0 or plus 12 dB for the weaker sources. That's about all. You just turn it on or you can turn it on on a, on a 12 volt trigger line if you want and you're ready to go. You don't care. We used to have DSP but DSP is much easier to mess up for the end customer. All right. Well, that was great. Thank you. We'll do a little bit of listening and oh. uh, I'll be back later to comment. Okay. Thank you, Tom. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.